Oh, um, today we are going to talk about the Git hooks and their role in checking the security of your code. And um, many have, many of us have come across this topic, especially with a pre-commit hook. But as it turned out, uh, only some of us use them in their work. Why? Unfortunately, a lot of developers neglect its um, neglect because uh, they think it's use, uh, usefulness and uh, it's just uh, labeled like uh, time consuming, irrelevant, and uh, we just uh, don't want to use it. But it's our main mistake. Uh, today we will go through topics like what is a WASP, common mistakes that developers made. Uh, I will show you some examples of the code and uh, uh, what errors usually we make. Also, we will talk about types of the Git hooks. And the last one what, uh, will be Git hooks in security check. Uh, I will show you some uh, um, some uh, Git hooks that we can use, like client side, server side, and uh, we will look at some examples, like uh, we uh, like common mistakes that we made. I will show show you how these Git hooks can find these mistakes. So first of all, many of us can ask, we have we already know about Git hooks, why we should uh, speak about these items again. Um, I will share my own experience with you. <clears throat> I wasn't a fan of Git hooks and uh, thought that they take a lot of time, especially if you need to push something quickly. Usually in this case, we don't think about the quality and safety of the code. And this is our main mistake. We are going to use these hooks to prevent bad commits from going to the server and keep lazy developers on the leash. We can also create like a continuous integration server to achieve that, but uh, it's much more complicated and feedback loop takes longer. The reason I have added a pre-commit hook to my project was because like not everyone in my team follows the PEP8 standards. Since it takes time to review and fix code, we decided to add like black pre-commit hook to automate this process. And uh, it worked. The time spent on reviewing the code has decreased and the quality has increased instead. Since we check the quality of the code before pushing it to the repository, we don't have to wait for Jenkins to build the container and do all the checks we need. Like uh, usually we have uh, in Jenkins some jobs. In our case, it was uh, we run by lint and by test. And uh, when we push the code, we are waiting to Jenkins while it's been built container. After that, uh, uh, it's uh, install all the dependencies. After that, he runs our tests and run by lins. And to check if all tests are passed, we need to wait all these jobs before. But you have already your project on your local computer. You, you have already built the Docker container, it's up. You need all dependencies. Why we need to wait Jenkins if you can do it on your local computer? So, and actually besides it's the bad practice to break the continuous delivery. Like all the time when Jenkins is failed, we assume it's bad practice. Git hooks can also help um, in discovering potential security threats early. Uh, every year, tech companies around the world lose a lot of money from cyber attacks. So that's why we need to, to talk about OWASP. OWASP is uh, the Open Web Application Security Project. It's a nonprofit foundation that works to improve the security of software. OWASP is an organization filled with security experts from around the world who provide information about application and the risk post in the most direct and practical way. The main item that OWASP works is OWASP top 10. Here we have some like uh, we can compare because um, OWASP top 10 is an online document on OWASP website. 
uh, it provides uh, the ranking of um, guidance ranking and guidance um, for the top 10 most critical web application security risks. The report is based on the um, all uh, thoughts of security experts from around the world. The risks are ranked and based on the frequency of discovering security defects. Like um, in, in 2017 years, the first place was injection. And we can say everyone knows about injection, but based on the all security risks that discovered on the big uh, companies, we can see that on this year, injection was on the first place. So, and also, um, it's not only based on the frequency, it's also based on the severity of the vulnerabilities. And um, it's also based on the potential impacts of the company. Um, right now, we have a new OWASP Tom 10 document. It was made for this year. And um, actually, OWASP maintaining this top 10 list. And it has done since um, 2003. And every two or three years, the list is updated in accordance with uh, changes in the security market. Um, OWASP's importance lies in the information it provides. So um, it serves as a key checklist and internal web application development standard for many of the world's largest companies. Right now, we will check uh, common mistakes that developers made based on this list. First of all, in unsafe uh, deserialization. Insecure deserialization often leads to remote code execution. Even if deserialization flows do not result in remote code execution, they can be used to perform attacks, including um, replay attacks, injection attacks, and privilege escalation attacks. And I'm sure that most of you heard about Pickle. I want to show you some example how um, we can, um, how Pickle can lead to remote code execution. Sorry, are you able to see my screen? Yes. Yep. Okay. Uh, here we have some like a JSON example. We have client and we have server. First of all, look at the code. Here we will use, uh, uh, like pickle, we serialize uh, delete client info class. Uh, it will be here. For, for example, it's very important client information. We will just try and code. Um, oh, sorry, it's just an example. So. It's pickle example we need. We use pickle, we will create um, like demo pickle. And for example, server re will receive this file. We will run it. And you see that uh, an our very uh, important client information will be deleted. Uh, what should we do in this case? First of all, don't use pickle. Um, it, it will be better to use JSON instead. For example, in some um, YAML format, it also finds some security issues and you need to know about it. And the second that can we talk about is dynamic execution. Uh, Python has a pair of very dangerous function, exec and eval. Both are very similar in terms of what they do. It's like process the strings passed to, the, to them as Python code. Exec expects the string to be a statement, which it will be executed and not return a value. Eval expects the string to be an execution and will return the computed value of the expression. Let's take a look. First of all, I will return this file because I use it in this example. Here we have some simple example. Um, just imagine that in exec, we need to, to 
to do some code. And um, right now we here have uh, like OS remove uh, function and we also remove some important library. We don't check what we do, we just execute this code. And here we will be able to see that this file again was deleted. So just raw execution, it's very dangerous as a pickling. You, you should not trust any data that you will receive. You need to check something. You need to get a list privilege. Uh, you need to check that it's not to include some deletion information or changes information. But um, many of developers made this mistake. Um, using components with known vulnerabilities. So uh, components such as libraries, frameworks, and other software models run with the same privilege as the application. If a vulnerable component is exploited, such an attack can um, facilitate serious data loss or server takeover. Application and a piece using components with known vulnerabilities may undermine application defenses and enable various attacks and impacts. So before we use some application or library, we need to be sure that this library, you don't know any vulnerabilities for this library. To do this check, you can use safety. We will talk about it later. I just want to show you some example. We have two common mistakes like component with no vulnerabilities and um, with um, XML external entities. Um, what can, can we say? Just look at the example. Here we have XML external entities example. I will show you some XML. You may know about like one billion loves attack. Uh, do you know this attack or should I explain it? Yes, XML attacks. There's <clears throat> a lot of repeating code that is uh, activated out there. Yes, you're right. So if you look at this XML, we, need, we can see that uh, we have like a reference to the entity. Uh, this entity has a reference to another entity. Uh, this reference here to, to another entity. Uh, so if you try to part this XML, you will find that, that you will run out of the computer resources. Um, so here we have uh, like uh, example. Uh, first of all, we will use uh, just XML standard library to parse it. Um, I will try to show you, but uh, like it will take some time. And after that, I will need to stop it because it will take like 10, 15 minutes. And after that, uh, I will find out that uh, I'm out of my resources. So I try to stop it because we will wait too long. What we can do instead? Like uh, if, if I show you on the screenshot, we will know that XML library has vulnerabilities. It's not the good way to use it. Instead of the XML, we need to use diffused XML. We will try to run this code with this library instead. So we will know like it's entities forbidden. This library discovered this XML. This finds like uh, a lot of reference to the entity. And right now we can see that uh, the billion loves attack. We will not wait and uh, our computer resources uh, uh, still be available. So also we need to show, we need to know about this. It's just, um, we can talk about this with uh, this item. It's just one example. Security misconfiguration. So uh, about security misconfiguration. Uh, it's uh, the most common seen issue. This is commonly a result of uh, insecure default configuration, incomplete or um, incomplete configuration, open cloud storage, misconfiguration HTTP headers, and uh, some errors, messages, uh, container sensitive information. 
it's uh, not only must all operating system frameworks, libraries, and applications be securely configured, but they also need to be patched, upgraded in the timely fashion. Uh, what does it mean? First of all, um, imagine that you use some library or framework and uh, it discovered this library or framework has some vulnerabilities. And besides that, you need to upgrade it to the newest version to be sure that this vulnerability was fixed. If you use the old library system framework, uh, some who knows about this vulnerability can use it and um, attack your application. And also here we can talk about uh, like if you forget to delete a uh, security is uh, security key and push it to the GitHub. It's also a big issue. You need to avoid it. Uh, I will show you some example. If I'm not mistaken, in the um, config. I think it's here. We have, for example, for the Flask application, it will be secret key. If you hard coded it and push to uh, GitHub, someone can use it. And secret key, it's not so, it's dangerous, but it's not so dangerous like uh, Postgres uh, uh, user password for, for your DB configuration. Uh, so it's, it's one of the example. And also um, while you are writing your application, you need to, um, to know that you have secure headers. For example, uh, what you can use like frame option, uh, cross-site scripting protection, you can specify it, uh, um, what uh, transport security, so what um, uh, and content security policy. It would mean uh, what JavaScript files are you trust or not. Just don't forget about it. It's very important in some case for your security application. The other it's weak uh, hash encryption algorithm. Here you can see some examples of um, uh, algorithm and uh, that you shouldn't use in your code. Uh, this list is come from the OWASP top 10. Uh, you can see like um, that leak issue and uh, they uh, each time they updated information. So if you're not sure what algorithm you should use, you just check OWASP 10, then application for the, that leak and discover it, uh, what algorithm you should use. Injection. Injection was on the first place for 2017 year and it's include like SQL, no SQL injection. Um, it occurs when untrusted data is sent to, to your application as part of a comment or query. Uh, for example, we expected some information, but instead we have a query. The attacker has stale data and can trick the interpreter into execution um, unintended commands or accessing data without proper authorization. How it happens? First of all, we have um, some places where injection can be occurred. Let's check. Uh, for example, if I'm not mistaken, we can look at the roles. Like in the flask here, you can specify what type you are expecting. If you're not specified the type that you are expecting, someone can, um, like write command here. And in the endpoint where we tr try to use it, for example, here we expected user ID. In our agenture, in our command, we will use ID. If someone wrote this command and you will not check type, it will be execute this command. And also, um, I want to check use. If you sometimes, um, sometimes we need to uh, write a custom command because um, we can use um, like ORM. In our case, it will be uh, SQL Alchemy. 
but um, we can expect some cases where alchemy will not help us and we will need to write some custom command and um, if we write our command like this for example we expected the uh, id for our to-do list and here it's not prepaid statement uh, who knows about the prepaid statement and how it works Anyone? I believe everyone knows, but they are just shy here. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Almost of us <laughs> probably knows. Uh, so, okay, I will try to show you example on the code. Just one second, because it's a lot I have prepared. Okay, here we have two examples. First of all, it's not prepared statement. So if someone puts here after password the command, it will be executed because uh, we, the prepared statement will interrupt user input as a string. The second uh, example here, it's a prepaid statement. What is happening? We write the commands, and after that, we specify it for the each input that we expected. We add this input that user adds. And after that, uh, this input will be interpreted as string. And even if I write here some commands, it will be um, our uh, query command will execute uh, this command as a string. So uh, it's no harm done. But in the first, if you try to include user input directly to the query, our command will be executed. And for example, if I want to uh, all user or something like that, I want just add uh, end password or uh, one equal a one. And here I will receive all the user information. So you need to be careful because like, yeah, sometimes it happens that you need to write your custom string, but just in case, write the prepared statement instead of the raw query. So um, we um, discussed uh, about uh, some mistakes that we can make. How we can discover it? First of all, uh, I am. We will talk about Git hooks. So uh, Git hooks are scripts that run automatically every time when a particular event occurs in a Git repository. Uh, this uh, let um, us optimize uh, Git's internal behavior and trigger customized actions at the key um, points in the developer life cycle. <clears throat> Git hooks are uh, um, used to automate, optimize uh, virtually any aspects of our development workflow. So, um, like I said, uh, before that, uh, my teammate, he mm, didn't follow PEP8 um, PEP standards. So adding black uh, helped to optimize this process. And uh, right now I'm not checking any issue like uh, the, how long the string is. Uh, do we have like, uh, white steps uh, after the after the some function uh, how um, do we have one quote or double quote for a string blake do it automatically and uh, hooks uh, can reside in either local or server side repositories we will also talk about this and um, they are only executed in response to the action in that repository what we can do we have client side and server side. We will talk about client side. Client side hooks are available for pre commit, pre rebase, post checkout, and post merge. Uh, they provide a fair amount of flexibility for the workflows on a local machine. They are not copied uh, with cloning uh, a repository. And adding hooks to client side will not enforce a policy across your organization. To implement automation, you need to use server side hook. What does it mean? First of all, we can look at the picture. If we have merge conflicts, pre-conflicts uh, or pre-push hooks are failed, we can just use force and no verify to push these changes. 
So in this case, our checks will not work because push force uh, will ignore our pre-commits, pre-push hooks. And um, here you can also look at the examples, like what hook name you can use and even uh, will trigger this hook. Uh, usually I am using pre-commit and pre-push. So if someone is smart enough to use uh, force uh, or to ignore a client's um, side git hooks, we can use server side git hooks. What's the difference? Server side hooks works like uh, client hooks, but they are stored in the server repository. They run before or after changes are pushed to the server. It, uh, if conditions are not met, these hooks can reject a push and send an error back to the client. So um, examples, when can it be used? Pre-receive hooks can run when changes are pushed from a client. Update hooks then run once on each branch being updated prior to changes being accepted. For example, if uh, someone on the code review accept all the changes and someone change the code after that, update hooks will run again. Uh, post receive hooks that run after the push process is completed and notify, for example, other users. Okay, so we can say client side, it's good for you to check, but uh, for your team, it will be better to use server side ho git hooks. So no one uh, will ignore these checks. Right now we will talk about Python security libraries that you can use. So, here you can see some linters that can be used to analyze security errors. I hope you know about this. Um, I will talk with, uh, from the safety. As we said, like components with no vulnerabilities. It would mean libraries and uh, some packages that uh, have uh, dependencies or security vulnerabilities. If you are not sure what should you use, just use safety. Safety scans Python dependencies for, no, uh, for non-security vulnerabilities. It's like a command line tool. And you can use it to check um, your local virtual environment, your requirements files, or any un input for sustain for dependencies with security issues. Mm. For example, if you use something insecure, you will get a report uh, on what exactly is affected. Safety also can show you what library you use instead or what version of library you should use. Uh, safety is uh, free and open source. Uh, so is the underlying free vulnerability database is updated one per month. And if you need something more new or you don't want to wait, safety also have this option that you can pay and receive new database with uh, updated database. But uh, for common checks, you can use this free, uh, free database and all, because uh, it's updated one per month and I think you will not miss something new in this case. Um, also, we have Doji. Uh, Doji looks for Doji code. It interacts a bit with Bandit. We will talk about Bandit a little later. Um, it can check for the hard-coded passwords, um, like uh, IP keys, uh, secret keys, etc. Um, unfortunately, for Doji, we don't have a pre-commit hook, uh, but uh, we can use uh, the prospector instead, because prospector use Doji for the checks. What about Bandit? Bandit is a tool designed to find common security issues to Python code. To do this, Bandit uh, processes each file, builds an ICT uh, from it, and runs appropriate plugins against these uh, ICT nodes. Once Bandit has finished scanning all the files, it generates a report. So uh, I want to show you uh, why Bandit is so useful because um, uh, Bandit was defined to be configuratable and cover a wide number of security needs. 
This is what makes Bandita so special, as it enables use either a local development utility or as part of the full uh, continuous integration, continuous deployment pipeline. Um, here I specified uh, Bandit vulnerability test, and it's also configurable with YAML file. So you can see like it's hard coded uh, values you can find. You can uh, you find assert, exec, also debug mode. So it's try accept, for example, it's uh, and so our weak cryptography key algorithm. And also Bandit finds uh, SQL injection. Like, uh, and uh, the best part of it, it's free. It's also open source and you can use it without paying for it. For it. Let's talk about pre-commit. Um, pre-commit I use on my project. Here you can see how to install it. Uh, the second command will generate um, um, like sample config file that you can use. After that pre-commit install, will install all, all pre-commits that you specified in this file. And for example, if you want to run it, you can run for all files, pre-commit all files. Let's check what we have. Um, in our directory, we have pre-commit config yaml. So, uh, like we said, once you have pre-commit installed, adding pre-commit plugins um, to your project. And um, here we have this file pre-commit config YAML. Um, and we add this pre-config YAML to, our, to the root of my project. And it describes the repositories and hooks um, that uh, I need to install. So what do we have here? For the pre-commit hooks, we can specify it. For example, it will delete additional white spaces. It will uh, um, fix uh, like the end of the file should end with uh, the empty string. It also check uh, our YAML configuration, etc. It's uh, by default. What do we need here? First of all, black. As I said, if you don't want to check your code for the PEP8 automatically, you can black. You can use black instead. It um, it will format your code automatically without any without. And you after that you will need to check uh, all uh, changes that black did. And if you're okay with it, you can add it and commit your changes. The second it's uh, safety. Here's also the repo. And uh, as I said, safety will check your requirements text um, that we have like, here I have two services, backend and backend secure. For all of them, we have uh, requirements text there. So safety will go here, look at these uh, packages that I use. And if something is wrong with them, he will notify me about this. Uh, after that, it's Bandit. Um, as we see that uh, Bandit uh, has a lot of uh, extensions, a lot of uh, checks and tests for the vulnerabilities, and we can use it. And as I, I said before, for the dodgy, we don't have um, pre-commit hook, so we use Prospector instead. Uh, why I commented our Prospector? Prospector is like a pilot, so it will check your code like for the imports. And for example, my application is building in the Docker containers. And in this case, I need to run Prospector inside my Docker container. Just on my local, it will notify me about the error like Flask is not installed for my project. So in this case, Prospector should be run inside container. What else? Precommit is fine, but we can do more. For example, Talisman. Talisman, um, it's also a tool that install uh, a hook to your repository to ensure that potential secrets or sensitive information do not leave the developer workstation. It validates the going um, changes set for things like uh, that look suspicious, such as potential 
SSH keys, authorization tokens, private keys, etc. Talisman can also be used as a repository history scanner to detect secrets that have already been checked and um, also it, it, it can inform you like for, for this. Talisman also is free. Here you how you can install it and you can use it like pre-commit hook and you can install it like pre-push hook. And also it can be run globally and uh, it also be, can be run for specific uh, project, specific repository. If you um, want to ignore some files, just put in the root directory this file. For example, you can see that uh, in the ignore uh, file, ignore config for the talisman, uh, I put all bootstrap and my HTML. I just want to check my Python code. So let's try to run pre-commit. Here I will run pre-commit for all my files. We can see that bandit check is failed. Just, uh, and it generates a report for us. So first of all, as I said, it's our injection, our raw SQL query. It's failed, but we expected it. Uh, here it's also can say that um, first of all, debug. And second of all, we hard coded our IP. So our host. So it's also the best, uh, the best practice. We have a lot of injection. Um, What's next? For example, we have our passwords. It's also specified that uh, we have possible hard-coded passwords. What else? You can see our passwords also hard-coded. Uh, secret key hard-coded in the config pie. Pickle. Uh, because it's uh, like it's a consider possible security implication associated with pickle models. As we see, yes, it's, it has impact because we can run some command um, pickle again, a scale query. And um, I didn't see that XML library. So, um, eval exec but I didn't see XML library. So you can see that uh, for this case, uh, one vulnerability wasn't discovered. What can we do? It was like our client site. We can talk about server side. I have prepared a couple examples. Uh, first of all, it's CodeQL. Uh, CodeQL lets you query code as raw which raw data write a query to find all variants of the vulnerabilities and um, it can uh, you can share it uh, with others. And CodeQL is free for the research and it's open source. Let's go to our code. Uh, here we have like a GitHub directory. We go to the CodeQL analysis and we can see that we run CodeQL when? on push to our master branch and on pull request to our master branch. Let's go to the Git. Here I will show you pull request from our pre-commit hook to the master branch. And here are some checks. For the code QL, code C, code scan, uh, LGTM. LGTM also buys uh, used by CodeQL. What we expected, we can go to lgtm.com and discover the issues. So let's check. Uh, first of all, uh, hard-coded passwords. It's specified can be sensitive information, uh, sensitive information. And also uh, I have included checks um, for the HTML here also. And we can discover that this um, when we put um, like uh, untrusted data to the HTML, HTML it, it can prevent the cross-site scripting attack. 
For example, if data titles will contain like a script uh, and uh, we will try to alert uh, all cookies that you have, it can be um, cross-site scripting. I will not check here. So it specified that uh, it's dangerous to use HTML instead without escaping um, characters. Also, we have like a SQL query injection. SQL query and also do. What do we miss here? First of all, pickle. Uh, second of all, secret keys. And also we don't have uh, XML. So it's not all the checks that we want to do. What else? We have code scan. I want to notify you that code scan is not free. You have only free trial, but after that you need to pay money. Here we have, it looks like um, if you have chance to work with SonarCoop, it looks like SonarCoop. Uh, here we also have security hotspots. But, uh, you know, we have uh, like um, with the form where we uh, use them, it's um, uh, the ZRF it is talking about. And we have free, we, um, cryptography. For example, if I use some hash sleep, it specifies maybe it's not uh, the list of the algorithms that you shouldn't use. It's also have uh, like uh, the same algorithms that me specified for the OWASP. But again, um, I can see that Beagle, XML, and secret keys that hard coded. So it's not so useful. We have codacy. Uh, here are the issues that codacy specified. As we see, it's also a scale injection. We have hard coded, uh, first of all, debug and hard coded um, IP address. We have stolen password. So it's um, it's also like possible hard coded password. We have pickle here and we have XML. So from all of this, uh, free server side checks, only codacy specified all that I need. But uh, before that, um, I hold like presentation for the cut kitchen and we also talk about these checks and uh, we have one place uh, and no one check set about this. For example, in the backend uh, server, we have models where we specified our database model. And for the user, we can see that we um, stole in the database our raw password. We don't hash it and it's wrong. We can't uh, use password in the database. We need to store hash there. And uh, no one, uh, I couldn't find check who uh, also discovered this issue. So besides all checks that we have, you need to be very careful when you do code review because these checks are not discovered by them right now, maybe in future. So it's all from my side. Maybe you have some questions for me.